Startup Refugees on verkosto, joka tukee turvapaikanhakijoita työllistymisessä ja yrittäjyydessä. Me halutaan valjastaa turvapaikanhakijoiden henkinen pääoma ja yhdistää se suomalaiseen yrittäjyyteen. Miksi? Koska ei ole mitään järkeä, vaan makuuttaa ihmisiä samalla, kun me tullaan tarvitsemaan uutta työvoimaa tulevaisuudessa ja etenkin uusia suomalaisia yrityksiä. Okei, okay, minä olen Osman Abdi. Asunut Suomessa 25 vuotta. Mitä kuuluu? Mullakin oli joskus oli sama tilanne. Mulla on mahdollisuus nyt minun yritys työllistää ihmisiä. Ihan ensiksi me halutaan selvittää, millaisia tyyppejä näissä vastaanottokeskuksissa on ja mitä he ovat tehneet aiemmin. Startup Refugeesin ensimmäinen vaihe on menossa. Me ollaan tänään tullut tänne Siilijärjen vastaanottokeskukseen. Meitä on 150 vapaaehtoista. Täällä on tullut vastaan lakimiehiä, lääkäreitä, opettajia, hirveästi osaamista, hirveästi potentiaalia. Näin voidaan saada tänne uusia innovaatioita, avata uusia vientimarkkinoita ja saada tänne ylipäänsä uutta tekemisen meininkiä. Tehdään vastaanottokeskuksista paikkoja, joissa asukkaat voivat innostua tulevaisuudesta. Eat your heart out, Han Solo. Hey, hey, hey. Fuck, Fuck yeah! yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. We're going to rearrange their stupid sets. This doesn't work at all. So let's bring these over. Are you going to be okay here? Stupid chairs. Right, okay. Uh, we want to sit on that one. I can take the pink one. I can take the pink one. Oh. Okay, I'll tell you what. Uh, right, you got you to... Right, ask. you sit there. Let's get the world here. Okay, get this rid of this thing. There's people out there. Whatever. <laughs> okay, we see everybody. Okay, you got it. Mm -hmm. I'm Mike Butcher from TechCrunch, but I'm not here to talk about TechCrunch or billionaires or raising money. I'm here to talk about a very, very important crisis, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps the greatest crisis Europe has faced since the Second World War. A tragic, moment in history where enormous numbers of refugees are coming in from troubled hotspots of the world, particularly Syria, of course, as we all know. And what's happened over the last few weeks and months is that many of us in the technology community have started to realize that it's not 1945. People will find, be able to find each other today as a result of new technology. You won't be searching for your brother or sister for 50 years, like in the 1945, that technology and the technology community can bring the power and creativity of our community to this crisis, both through apps, through data, through uh, our community itself. And that's exactly what's happened over the last few weeks and months, incredibly um, incredibly exciting to see. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a moment in history, and the one takeaway we want to give you, to you after this panel is get involved. Get involved into this, in this moment. Get involved in the communities that are being built around this issue now. Right. Now, let's talk about this. Now, don't, it's not just another all-male panel because the co-founder of uh, Refugees <laughs> on Wales is also a, as a woman. So, anyway, <laughs> Anne is here in spirit. Yes. So let's, let me just introduce. So Riku, Riku from Startup Refu Refugees over there. We've got Appa, who's from Funzi, the mobile network, mm -hmm. uh, mobile learning network. We've got uh, Ferdi from Refugees on Rails in Berlin, mm -hmm. and we've got Hesam from Job Spotting. So welcome, gentlemen. Thanks. Let's start yeah. just briefly, and also, uh, I think I should probably uh, also uh, mention that uh, I am uh, the founder, of co-founder with a small team in London of a, a movement, really, not really an organization, but a movement called 
uh, Tech Fujis. Uh, we are running a conference on December the 2nd in London, uh, which you are all invited to. TechFujis.com for the date, 2nd of December. And we have been trying to smash together both the tech community and the NGOs and the charities working in this space. Ladies, um, gents, I mean, let's, let's first of all, like, uh, let anybody here has, is a refugee, has been a refugee, or knows refugees? There you go, right? Many of us are touched by this issue. Um, gentlemen, I mean, let's, let's think about this first of all. You know, uh, there have been kind of apps uh, have been appeared uh, to, you know, I mean, the, the platforms that the refugees are using right now are the platforms that we already know, like Facebook and, and WhatsApp, right? Yeah, I mean, my father was, was a refugee in the early 90s, and compared to what is out there today, it's, if you consider helping people leave war, there's so much happened that, that it's amazing. Like, the people have access to, to WhatsApp, to email, to Facebook, things we think for, for granted, which simply didn't exist 10, 10 15 years ago for, for, the, for, for, for those people. And these tools, like Google Maps and all this stuff, helps them to get away safely as fast as possible. Of course, there's a lot of tragedies happening along the way, but still, the technology has definitely helped those people through the last years. There are these enormous uh, um, Facebook groups and people using Skype. Um, there's even uh, data sets around the people trafficking networks and the smuggling going on. Uh, I mean, you, Ape, you've done a lot of work so far, haven't you? You've done a lot of research to, to get your app up and running. I mean, what have you found? Yeah, we found that, first of all, the European Union is a, um, is a legal entity that is, that is constructed of these small pieces. So, so regardless of the European Union's intent to create this sort of like how we work, we started with a design-based approach. What do the users, what is the journey map for the refugees? Design, but user-centered design. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then <clears throat> underneath that, we're developing an open data framework that is then sort of like integrates into the silos of the official systems. This should enable in the future to use platforms not as, as something that is a mammoth or a, a monolith, but actually sort of create new small things that are flexible and meet the needs of the individual refugees. Because the individual setting so the situation is generic, you are somewhere, so it, generic usage of Facebook is good, but then when you go to a local level in, in Tornio, you know, up high in Finland, or in Greece, the situation is different. So that's why you need the, the massive scalability of, of generic features, and then you need to have those local apps that are developed within the communities. Hmm. Is that, is that the refugees on, uh, refugees on rails, you know, just describe to everybody what you're doing and how you started. Um, the story of refugees on rails starts with a guy called Mohammed, who is a refugee from Iraq. And he was working as a systems engineer uh, in Iraq um, until he and his family became displaced. And he's been sitting in Germany for two years without a computer, uh, without access to training or the development of the skills that he has. And when you meet this person as an individual, you begin to realize the scale of the stories. Because just like Mohammed, there are many others who um, started working on projects or have background in things that are actually very relevant to the European community. One of the refugees from Sudan, Tariq, uh, worked on a medical database with SQL and, and um, Oracle when he was in Sudan. And so you have these incredibly talented and very motivated people who are sitting in the refugee camps. And if you take a look at the World Health um, data, more than half of post-traumatic stress is caused after the transit. So sitting in an environment like that for 14 to 20 months, where you have absolutely no agency, no ability to impact your life and your future, is incredibly demotivating. And, and I think every one of us will go mad. So Anne, who you mentioned, um, was having an Because I think well, that is incredibly important to emphasize, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. The, you know, the, all the images we see on the television of, of you know, people coming in boats, that's all the stuff that you see right there because it's a news story. But the yeah. reality is that then you're in a, a, a camp or, I mean, yeah. and, and in fact, um, I've been obviously become very interested in this myself. And in fact, the average time that a refugee spends in a refugee camp or a, a detention center is 70, something like 17 years. 
Mm. It's absolutely enormous. That's the average globally. Yeah. So it's in, it absolutely, as you say, it's incredibly demotivating. Yeah. And so when Anne, um, who felt very touched by the story because her grandfather was a refugee in Denmark um, from the German government because he was a pacifist publisher. So her family survived for 16 years in Denmark as refugees. She looked at this, uh, this problem, and as a design thinker, she said, this, this is a no-brainer. It's really easy. There are a lot of old laptops lying around um, that we can get in contact. And then she met up with Mest, uh, Weston and Ahmed, um, who are both very deeply involved in the startup community in Berlin. And um, they were saying, we have massive gap for resources. Startups really need people yeah. based on their skills, yeah. not on the, the passport they carry or the country where they come from, because the tech community has always been open to working across borders, across cultures. And that's where the, the spark of the idea came, that we can accelerate economic integration and also value human dignity by bringing the tech community and the refugees together in this environment. And that's, it, this is very interesting because I think what's happened is that uh, amongst the tech community, we've done, we've, uh, there's been a lot of thinking around what apps can we make and what, ma what mapping can be done and you know, how do we distribute uh, Wi-Fi and things like that. You know. so, but also one of the very strong themes that has come out of the tech community and one that is definitely represented here is that the, that end piece, which is the, actually in a way the hardest piece of what happens after the refugee seeks asylum and gets somewhere, what happens next? The startup refugees uh, here in Finland, you are very much aligned with this and you've built an incredible network uh, of uh, people and organizations who are getting get involved. So, Richard, tell us about what's going on with you guys. Sure. <clears throat> so, we have more than 250 companies, private ones, there's government sources, there's uh, uh, all kinds of uh, private foundations and private persons as well, volunteers. And what we try to do, we try to connect these people as quickly as possible into the Finnish society. Uh, the asylum seekers might be, even in, in Finland, uh, where there's, this year probably 30,000 people have already uh, been... Which doesn't sound asylum. a lot, but per, per capita, it's actually top, top five yeah. or something, right, top, in Europe. Top three, top three in Europe top three. per capita. And we need to do something for this, for sure. And our motto is, welcome, Okay, we don't have jobs, let's create them together. That's the idea. So it's really, it's a big, big startup program, not just obviously in technology, but in anything from small enterprises, whatever. Anything from, from small micro companies into, we, I'm pretty sure we will find, we've heard of stories of, of uh, enormous uh, people who have, who have a lot of skills who are there sitting and waiting. Why don't we take their skills into use? and help them to find out uh, networks, find out companies to work with, or found their own companies. I I'm pretty sure we'll find out some good startups from that project too. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this is sort of like, and Funzi as a learning platform is something where, where everyone then could, where the job seekers and the employers could sort of like qualify the training. Because one of the issues that we're seeing is we don't know, somebody has skills, but how can we verify those skills? So it's sort of like services like ours, where you can actually test the skills. It's like verify that the skills exist, make it more employable. And that's sort of like integration, acceleration, sort of like also verifying the skills and enhancing those skills. Those are sort of like core themes, because without that, we will have to have the long-term impact that we could have. We, we could have and we should have. So you're, because you're, interestingly enough, you built your learning, mobile learning platform very much for developing countries. Yeah. Um, and now you're, you're porting it, or you're pivoting part of it part of it, as it were, to this crisis. Yeah. And you're doing a lot in Arabic content now, Somali, and you're working yeah. with a lot of agencies. Yeah, so it, what, what happened was that we sort of like started in the emerging markets, rolled it out, and in September we got verification that we actually produce results that scale. So we could replicate, we could predict, and so all of a sudden then this crisis happened. I called you, remember the one morning when I understood, you know, Mike, you know, there's this thing happening. So what just happened, we had to roll out. And this is the weird thing, we are, we are a poor startup and we've had to roll it out with cash from our pockets because nobody funds. You can't walk to a VC and say, give me three million, I'll give you back, because what we're actually, the equity that we create is, is human equity. And that's right. like, but, but that's what happened, you know, we, yeah. had, we had the results and we had to scale. So, but I think the very interesting thing, what you've done is this mobile learning platform, which service. is very much... Service. So, if, sorry? Service. Mobile learning service, sorry. Uh, which means that, yeah, you can reach people pretty much right in the palm of their hand, right? Yeah. And so, 
Uh, so turning uh, with you, Hassam, and uh, job spotting. Now, job spotting is a startup, like many startups here. Um, but the interesting the b thing about what you guys are doing is you're trying to um, you're trying to uh, make it easier for people, more transparent to find the jobs that they are qualified for. Just unpack yeah. that for us. I mean, definitely, one of the major things we do differently than other job sites is to make the whole job market transparent to anyone. And if you think about the people who arrive to our countries, re re refugees, integration really means to as, uh, trying to accustom these new people to their new surroundings. And one of the main things is, of course, to get people integrated is work. And a lot of those people, some of them might be skilled, many of them aren't. But they are hardworking and they want to, uh, they want to learn and they want to figure out what to do. And for us, by making this data available and transparent, we help them making good decisions in terms of what skills they need to learn, what skills are in demand and are not in demand. So should I, be a, should I become a nurse? Should I start learn coding? Or should I become a learn, you know, become an online marketer, whatever, so that I can have a good future, for, build a good future for myself, for my uh, children, and, and so on. And I think that's really important, and that's what helped my parents, that's what helped me to, you know, assimilate faster into, into the new culture. So um, is part of your strategy going to be try to also try and um, work with all these different agencies, work with these initiatives as well, and do right. something specific, or are you just offering your platform in a general I, manner? I mean, currently we're offering this data open to anyone, anyone to use, and uh, we're looking for partners for events, as, as you mentioned, to try and to add this new, new, new knowledge uh, to, in terms of helping people learning skills and so on. And right. Similar to what he said before, that we are at the at the last stage, so it's great to help people, you know, move and. Uh, come to our country, and the next thing that in the long term is that helping these people become successful in the many years to come. And I think that's the really challenging part when the, when the media coverage stops, when it's not so so sexy to uh, be in the in the TV anymore. But actually, the years yeah. afterwards. This is actually one thing we've got. We wanted to draw out and to also to um, make you guys out there think hard about this problem which is making all of these initiatives that everybody's involved in and trying their hardest to get involved and address, the, address this terrible crisis, um, but also to make it sustainable. And, you know, one of the, what a great tragedy would be for all of these initiatives uh, um, that you're involved in and doing, uh, you know, wither on the vine and, and, you know, people forget about them and the hype goes away and that kind of thing. How are we going to be involved for the long term because this issue is not going away and it's not going to go away for years 20 years maybe also this well, issue is not new i mean there's been there's been refugees there's been people fleeing those countries for years for years and years yeah and it's only now it has become more of a tragedy there's more tv coverage there's you know yeah i mean it's been on. around for years it's now that's yeah. you know hitting us in the face right now go ahead I, I strongly believe that this is the time when, when the startups 3.0 and the world 3.0 become one. It's like, it's about time because mobility covers the whole planet. It's the only method to reach everybody like this. And so like combining these things, yes, we'd be producing games and ringtones and blah, 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 but we can actually have a sustainable change. And this also allows us to create structures that go beyond these static structures that we have now created. We can actually rebuild the world so that this crisis doesn't need to exist. And that's sort of like, if you look at all the new currencies and all the possibilities, like, like mm. this whole, if you look at this value channel, mm. what we can create, you know, starting here and, and doing this and doing that and, do, and teaching, we could create a new world. There is no reason if we, you know, the old world is broken, that's why this is happening, how about fixing it by building a new one? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very positive about this. We started our project uh, just a few months ago, <clears throat> and we had to close, actually, the... We had to not to let people in anymore because we were surprised. There were so many companies, so many privates, uh, so many individuals, volunteers wanting to join. Yeah. Now we've got ourselves together. We have a good pro coordinating in the project. So now it's open again. So please, all of you, welcome. Join us. Join our troops. Uh, this is not the. Uh, this is new times now. We're working together with everybody here. Mm. This is. Uh, I, we're I not in a silo, right? Yeah. I think one of the keys to making this sustainable is, uh, or sustainable is to use an approach of co-creation with the refugees. Because I think quite a lot yeah. of the, the programs... This is very important. 
um, that we've run into, you have events where there are 60 volunteers and two refugees coming there because it's designed from a mindset of we know what's good for you. Right. Um, I think the tech community has always been incredibly good at prototyping and iterating with the user. And so in this instance, I think making sure that you are connected to the base, understanding the constraints that they are living under and the kind of things that they are, are, are challenged with, and where their ambitions and their dreams lie, that is the starting point towards sustainability and, and making sure that it's of value to them and then ultimately to the communities where they are living and where they will be situated for a while. I and mean, I think also I think the wor it's worth emphasizing that this is, you know, it's a, it's a tragedy and a terrible crisis, but also weirdly there's this also amazing opportunity for Europe because uh, not only are our populations stagnating, uh, we also have this enormous uh, problem of we actually don't have enough skilled people for all the jobs that are going to be created over the next f few years. Uh, Nilly Crows, when she was a digital commit high commissioner mm. in Europe, was very fond of saying that Europe will need a million developers in the next five years. Yeah. And, yeah. well, you know what? This is, a, this is an opportunity. This is an exciting opportunity and a great place to be uh, but, you know, for getting people in the tech community. And I think what's very interesting is that for Ruby, the Refugees on Rails project uh, mm. that uh, Anne and Ferdy have created uh, is that, um, you know, your teaching skills, and one of the things that you said earlier to me was that um, the technology industry is very welcoming to integration. I mean, you know, you put people in front of a laptop or whatever and, and off you go, right? You don't, it's much easier to do that in a way than it is to become a baker or something. Yeah, or a doctor or a lawyer where the skills haven't actually um, been able to, do, to transfer. So what I think we are seeing now is digital disruption of a wicked problem. And we need to move away from the old world thinking of scarcity to the new world thinking of opportunity and growth. Because if you, if you take a look at what this human potential, when it's unlocked and unleashed and connected with the technologies that we are all collectively working on building, I don't see this as a, as a crisis. It's by far the biggest opportunity that Europe's had in the last 60 years. And, and, and just looking at, for example, China, if we take away, so I, I, you know, I was at the UN conference last week, did, some, did, we, did see it uh, last, last weekend. I, I kept on saying, and they kept on saying, telling to me that take the crisis away. This is what digital nomads are like. There's 200 million people who are building China who roam around. This is the future. Mike, where, where's your home? Your home is in the cloud. So that's sort of like, and we, we could enable this. And I think, and this is sad to say, I think a lot of the crisis happens in our brains when we see these strange people coming. We don't know how to interact. My friend John Traxler from the UK said, this is the age of Rome. Whether we open our integrate work together or things get broken. I see no other option than just fix this. Finally, um Let's, let's sort of round this off by saying, you know, what do you need from this community here? Where do you want to go next? What are your asks? What, what would you like people to get involved in, Ricky? Well, within Startup Refugees, our next step, we are collecting data of the actual asylum seekers. What are their skills? What are their dreams? What kind of, uh, uh, what kind of uh, thing they have already done? And what we need, we need everybody. We need, we need volunteers to do this matchmaking. We need, we need volunteers to, to collect the data. We need code people. We need developers. Uh, there's still a lot to do within the means of uh, getting over and, the bureaucracy. And what's the, what's the best way for these people to reach you? Yeah, go to startuprefugees.com and join us. Startuprefugees.com, fairly. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest ask that we have at this stage is that we've walked into massive open doors in terms of specific sponsorships, so free Wi-Fi, co-working spaces, teachers, access to Ruby courses, everything has this been given. This is all in Berlin or are you going um, to other things? No, we, we're actually going, we, I mean, European-wide, we have been getting a lot of support from Amsterdam, we've had interest from Vienna, we've had loads of interest from everywhere. The challenge over is no one's really interested in 
funding the infrastructure that makes sure that you can scale that and keep a continuous level of quality across all of these things. So that's the conversation that we're getting involved in now in terms of how can we turn this into a sustainable organization that is developing all of this value for all of these organizations um, that ultimately benefit from the skills. And Ape, what do you need and what do you want? Uh, we, we, we'll be rolling out in the camps in Jordania in a couple of weeks. We're rolling out in the European Union countries. We are a private startup. We're not doing a profit, but we, we have costs. The, the infrastructure of, you know... Do you, need, do you need partners or do you need... Yes, what do you need? Yes. Well, we need money, cash, and then we need local partners that are luckily volunteer organizations. Can you go and like, get to these VCs and say, look, guys, time to put your hand in the pocket. Yes, exactly. Right. Yes, thank That's you, Mike. The, right, thank you're you. a VC, come and talk to Arpe. <laughs> it's not about investment, this is about, this is about solving an issue. And Hassan, what would you, what do you um, I mean, my ask is more of a, just a general, general uh, ask to not give in to your fears and uh, take a step forward and not trying to, uh, you know, fight your anxiety. This is a big humanitarian situation and yeah. um, there is a lot of powers that want to take, a, take, a, a, take advantage of our fears and our anxiousness against this, yeah. you know, unknown thing and don't give in to that. There's don't give in to fear. No. Right. You guys stand up, right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you are going to get involved in this technology community response to the humanitarian crisis before us, stand up with us. Now, come on. <laughs> are we ready? Yeah. Yes. Hey. All right. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Yeah, that's good. Thanks.